right, it is recording. All right, so first thing first, uh, we have a homework assignment that was due like seconds ago, okay? I hope everybody got a chance to turn it in. All right, so I'm gonna go over the answers to that particular you know, homework assignment first, and then we'll go ahead and you know, proceed with new material. All right, so let's take a look at the questions. All right, so question number one. Set A has the elements lowercase a, b. Set B has the elements a, b, and c. Uh, which of the following is true? So this one is, you know, you can only choose one. You have to choose one and only one. So only one of these is the correct answer. Uh, B is a subset of A. No, because you know, B has additional elements compared to A. B is an element of A. No, A is an element of B. No, A is a subset of B. That is the correct answer. Any questions about this one? Nope. All right, moving on. Question number two, given that A union B has the elements lowercase a, b, c, d, e, and a minus b, or the difference between a and b is c, e, which of the following combinations of definitions of a and b satisfy this constraint? So each line or each item is a potential option, and you have to give me all the ones that will meet the requirement. So what we are really looking for is if you look at all the elements between A and B, we have everything, which is A, B, C, D, E. Uh, but we also want C and D to be only in A but not in B. Okay, so that is actually a stronger constraint than the first one. So when you look at the first one, they, I think they all meet the requirement. Okay, so it is up to A minus B equals to C, E that makes, you know, the, uh, makes it different. Now note that this is equal to, it is not a subset of, so that means you know, we are looking at exactly just C and E in A but not in B. So A can, so this is, this cannot be the correct answer because in this case A minus B would have been A, B, C, D, E. This is a correct answer because A has C, E but B does not, okay? So we'll take this one as the, one of the correct answers. This one is also a correct answer because C and E are just in A but not in B. Um, yes? Sorry, I wanted to ask, how is that a union? I understand the, the, the operator of the second part of it. I understand that it's in A but not in C. Mm -hmm. But how, is, how are those connected in any way? The, how is A a union? So both of these are constraints. I need this condition to be true. I also need this condition to be true. Which means, you know, between A and B, I have to be able to find, and you know, exclusively A, B, C, D, and E. That's the union. But we also need the, the ex additional constraint that C and E as elements can only be found in A but not in B. So there are two constraints of, you know. That would be intersection. A union B means you know, for each element in the result, it has to be found in A or B. But it's not an either or, so it can be found in both, or it can, it can be found in just one of them. Yep, because it's a regular or and not an exclusive or. So that means you, know, you can find, you know, as long as you can find A, lowercase a, in A or B as sets, then you're, you're good. Yep. So this is not a good answer because in this case, A minus B would have been an empty set. This is also not a good, you know, because A minus B also would have been an empty set. This one is also not good because A minus B would have been an empty set. This one is good, okay, surprisingly, this one is good because C and E are both only found in A but not in B. And this one is not good because you know, A minus B would have been A, B, B, which is not what we're looking for. So are we good with this one? All right. So moving on to number three, uh, choose the correct answer. Um, lowercase a is an element of a set that has a single element, which is a set of a in it. The answer is false. Okay. Question number four, choose the correct answer. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, that was, that was another one that I had trouble with. Could you explain that a little bit deeper, why that's false? Because the set of 
an element A is not the same thing as A. Yes, so this thing here is not the same thing as this thing here. In other words, what I'm asking is the file A inside a folder that has a subfolder that has A in it. But the element of applies only to one level. So what the outer set has is a folder, not a file, which is what A is. So but if it was one set of brackets, then it would just uh, Correct. That would, be that would be correct. So if I only have one curly brace, instead of double, then this would have been true. Yep. And then number four is choose the correct answer. ABC as a set is a subset of the set ABC, and that is true. Every set is a subset of itself. Okay. And number five, choose the correct answer. You know, the union between the set ABC and the set AB is just the set of ABC. That is true. And then number six, okay, I like these questions. These are the ones that require a little bit more thought because what you need to do is to think about, okay, what if this is A and this is B? What's, you know, can I make this happen? So the question is asking, what is the value of the following expression regardless of the content of A and B? In other words, you know, does it, is it always true, which is this answer here? Is it always false, which is this answer here? Or can you set up cases where it is true if I set up A like this and B like this, or it, and it is false if I set up A and B you know, like this, okay? So let's, let's take a look. The first one says you know, A minus B is an empty set, okay? And in the context of a subset of, if A minus B is an empty set, does it say anything about the you know, subset of? So the definition of A minus, yes, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that that would imply that everything that's in A that is in B, or that. So it means everything in A, okay, so this empty set means, you know, there's nothing that is only in A, but not in B. Okay. Say again. No, they do not have to be the same. A, B can contain additional elements but B must have everything that A has. In other words, A is a subset of B. This is basically saying A is a subset of B. This is the negation of A is a proper subset of B. So um, just because A is a subset of B, does it imply that A is not a proper subset of B? That implication is not always true, okay? So we'll, to illustrate it, let's set up some examples, okay? So let me go ahead and I'm going to use Notepad you know, because Notepad is much faster in some, for something like this. So let me go ahead and use Mousepad, which is the Linux version of Mousepad. So, all right, so we'll set up some simple cases first, and then we'll look at the boundary cases. All right, all right. So we'll set up A to be mm, just low, just one two. Okay, so. One A has one two in it, and then B has, oops, B has caps lock. There we go. B is uh, one two and three. All right. So in this case, A minus B is empty because everything in A is also in B. So I cannot say there's anything that is in A but not in B. So that means you know, the left hand side of the implication is true. The right-hand side of the implication is A is a subset of B, but negated. So that means you know, this is actually false, okay? The implication itself is false. It's because A is a proper subset of B is true, but negation of that is false. So we end up with true implies false, which means the implication is false, okay? But now we want to set up you know, another example where you know it is either false on one side or it is um, uh true and true you know, for both sides, okay? Because in order for the implication to be true, it's easy. If the left-hand side is false, then the whole thing is going to be false. So that means, you know, can you give me an example where A minus B is not in the empty set? Easy peasy, just reverse this, right? Okay, so if I set up another test case, which is A has one, two, three in it, and B only has one, two in it, 
then A minus B is going to be the set of three, which is not the empty set. That makes this equality false, which also makes the entire left-hand side of the implication false, which makes the entire implication true. So that means it kind of depends on how you set up A and B. So that means that the correct answer is depends on how sets A and B are defined. Because you cannot say that it's always true or always false. Is that okay? All right, okay. So let me move on then. Question number seven. Okay, this one. Yes. Proper subset of? Yes. No. Because if A is not a proper subset of B, A can be the same as B, or you know, A is not even a not A is not even a subset of B. So in order for this to be false, you know, all you need is to make sure that you know, I mean, the easiest way to make sure this is false is A has additional elements compared to B. All right, number seven. What is the value of the following expression? Okay, so I made sure that I use you know, enough you know, parentheses to make sure that there's no way to interpret this in any other way. So A union B equals to A, excuse me, A intersecting with B is the same as A union B implies A and B are the same. So in this case, you know, this implication is always true. You cannot find a single case that make this false. All right. And then number eight is A is an element of B implies it is not the case that A is a subset of B. Okay. So with this one, you know, you have to come up with examples. And this one really tests whether you understand that a set can be an element of another set. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at, you know, a few examples here. So I can now say that A is the set of one, two, and then I can make B a set that has the set of one, two as one of the elements. In addition, I also have one, I also have one and two as the elements of B. So that means B has three elements in it. It has the element A, the element of B, and then the element that by itself is a set of the elements one and two. Is that okay? I think I misspoke. I think I, instead of using one and two, I said A and B. So let me say that one more time. So B has three elements. One is an element, two is an element, and then the set that has both one and two is also an element of B. Is that okay? So with this, let's take a look at you know, what happens to the left-hand side. In this case, A is an element of B is actually true. Okay, so we have the left-hand side being true, which means the implication can be false or true. And then when we look at the right-hand side, A is a subset of B is also true. So you know, the negation of that is false. So that means using this particular configuration, this implication is actually false. Is that okay? Are we good? Sure. So if A has one and two as its elements, and B has the set of one, two as one element, one as an element, and two also as an element, then this implication is false. Because the left-hand side of the implication is true, but the right-hand side of the implication is false. The right-hand side is false because A is actually a subset of B, but since I negate it, the true becomes a false. So that means we have true implies false, and then the truth table of implication says the outcome of the implication is false. So it is possible to make this false. So the next question is, can I make this true? Once again, to make this true is super easy. All you have to do is to say, okay, can I come up with a case where A is a set, but it is not, not an element of B? Pretty easy. All you have to say is A is, okay, the same thing here, and B is an empty set, because nothing is an element of the empty set. Then, because the left-hand side of the implication is false, that means the implication itself 
is returning a value of true, and therefore, you know, I cannot say it's either always true or false. I have to say, yeah, it kind of depends on how you set up A and B. Is that okay? These questions are designed to help you kind of think about possible cases, okay? And in this particular case, you know, most of the time people can say that it is true because it's very easy to make the left-hand side false. It is when you make the left-hand side true, can you also make the right-hand side false at the same time? That really is the question. All right. So, well, at least, you know, that's what I think the answer is supposed to be. Yeah. Hmm? This one. Mm -hmm. There's no way to make the first one, oh, make, to make it false is easy. You just have to say, you know, A and B have different elements, okay, entirely different. But if you make the left-hand side of the implication false, what happens to the implication? The implication itself becomes true. So that means, you know, you cannot, the, the false is not a problem, can you make the, question, the real question is, can you make the left-hand side true and yet make the right-hand side false? Because when, when you have true implies false, then the implication itself is false. Because it's easy to make this true. This one is easy to make true. The question is, can you make it false? And the answer is no, you cannot. All right. So I'm hoping this was helpful, you know, to if not for anything else, is to help you kind of get a sense of you know, how much of this material you're understanding because you know, it really is designed to exercise you know, all the knowledge that we have talked about in the previous classes. Are we good so far? Okay, all right. So the homework assignments really do not count for a whole lot of points um, because you know, all the homework assignments added up is only 20%. So that means if you get something wrong here, it is not a big deal when it comes to your final grade, especially your letter grade, because your the letter grade are what your twelve point five percent to get a D, and then thirty seven point five percent to get a C, and so on. So in the grand scheme of things, missing a few questions in a quiz is not a is not a bad thing. In fact, it is a good thing. So you go like, heck, how can that possibly be a good thing? because it is really low stake right now, and it exercises you know, kind of all the tricky cases, and if you spot, you know, if you got some of these you know, answers wrong, that means you know, your understanding of some of these concepts may, not, may need some refinement, right? So you do the refinement, so by the time we get to actually exam one, then you would get everything down correctly. Okay, so it's a good thing that you, you know, spot you know, some um, misunderstanding you know, because of the homework assignment because then it gives you a chance to go like, okay, I'm not quite understanding this correctly. What is the correct way to understand this concept? Yep. Would you be able to put like an exam level question for each one of these quizzes so that you can get gauge of what your more appropriate or what you think is right for the exam? Sure. In fact, I'll do even better. I will actually give you the entire exam one from last semester. I have no idea what exam one is going to look like this semester, but I can give you the old one. So I can say you know, this is exam one from spring 2024. <clears throat> C attached. This is usually the worst way to send an email. All right, so now I need to go to that folder. Uh, one, two, three, x1.000.pdf. There we go. Yes, I have very specific path to find my stuff. <laughs> yes? I have a curiosity. What was the one, two, three, four bit? Huh? The one, two, four, three. So one, two is re is referring to the year. Um, let me see. Let me. I have to remember this. No, one, two, four. Okay. So the first three digits, one, two, four, 
is what you add to 1900 to get to the current year. <laughs> and then the three is the semester. So three represents the spring semester. Nine is for the fall semester. If I were to teach this class in the summer, it would have been a six. So that's internally how sections are coded. So I just, you know, once I understand it, it go, I go like, oh, okay, so it's, pretty, it's systematic enough that I can use it. So that's why it's, it's one, two, four, three, and the current semester is one, two, four, nine, because it's the fall semester. Okay, so that's the actual class you learn? Huh? That's the actual class codes are generated? Have ARC? Yes. So when, when I go to, it's, it's a very internal thing. Most people cannot get to see it. Um, but internally, you know, all the sections, you know, you know, are coded with the college first, which is ARC, followed by a colon, and then the semester code, which is one, two, four, nine for this semester, and then the five-digit number that you guys actually get to see in the class schedule. Okay. Yep. Because I have to work with a database, you know, that has to do with enrollment of classes across semesters. So I have to learn about all of these internal representations. Anyway, so now you have exam one from last, uh, from the last semester. Um, I would, if, if I were you, I would go and try to answer some of those questions like right away, okay? Because you know, that gives you some idea of, you know, what kind of a test last semester looked like. But as I said, I have no idea what it looks like this semester because it is too far along that uh, for me to think about right now. I can only tell you that it should not be the same as last semester. Yes? But it's the same stuff. It would cover the same scope, yes. Mm -hmm. But I usually I try to you know, think of a different way to ask the questions to see whether you guys understand the concepts or not. Yep? According to the syllabus, <laughs> we have two exams. Exam one is about one third through the semester, so that would be usually between week five and six. You know, uh, this is the beginning of week four, so I don't think. Well, maybe not. I haven't decided yet. Maybe I would always give you at least one week of warning because I always give the, the entire class. Um, the solution of the exam of the previous semester, one week, exactly one week before your exam one. So that means if I'm not talking about the practice exam today, it cannot be next Monday. So I think it's going to be two weeks from now. So let's you know, just pencil it in as you know, two weeks from now is our, our exam one. Um, did I answer the question? So there's exam one, exam two, and then the final exam. Um, exam one and two are both 20% uh, each and use up the entire lecture you know, time period. And then the final exam is, you know, as scheduled in the final exam schedule, which is two hours long. Are we good so far? Okay. All right. So I do give, I have another homework assignment for you. And this one is called Just Functions. I just released it today, okay? If you refresh your browser now, you should be able to see it. Um, it only has nine points, okay? So once again, you know, fairly low risk you know, kind of assessment, but I can tell you the questions are not easy, okay? By design, they are not easy. So if I were you, I would get started on this one as early as possible. And once again, you can only uh, submit the attempt once. So open it, read all the questions, think about you know, all the questions, read the material, um, and then you know, make sure you click submit you know, before next week on Monday before 3 p.m. Okay, so the due date structure is the same as the first homework assignment. And this one only asks about what makes a set of two tuples you know, a function. So that material we have already covered. Okay, whatever we talk about today is you know, specific to injection, surjection, and bijection. So that's all new material that does not relate to your homework assignment. Are we okay so far? Hmm? So the exams are open book and open notes, but only when they are printed or handwritten on paper. But there's no limit to as to how many pieces of paper. In other words, you, someone cannot bring in an iPad. No electronics. Yep. 
a calculator if it's allowed. I don't think it's going to be very helpful, but some people just feel safer when they have a calculator. So for those people, bring your calculator. I don't, I don't think it's going to help with this particular topic, but if people want to bring their calculator, be my guest. So no cell phones, no tablets, no local computers. You know, everything should be on paper. All right, so what we're going to do is we are now resuming our discussion of injection, surjection, and bijection. And I believe, let's see, is that the right one? Nope. This is before, okay, this is the, the topic from before. And this one is even earlier. Okay, let's get rid of that. I'm just going to click it. Okay, there we go. All right, so last time, we went through the exercise to uh, kind of demonstrate this one single statement. That was what we did last time. Um, the whole thing was captured in Joplin or basically markdown format, and I sent that to the whole class. Is that correct? Okay. So what we'll do today is to look at this and go like, okay, is there a better way to kind of define, or I shouldn't say better, is there a different way to define injection, okay? Once we know that f is already a function, can we define injection or injective, okay, as a property of a function using a different way? The answer is yes, we can use this way to do it, okay? So let's go ahead and read this out loud first, okay? Because we want to use ages to describe a concept, and then we'll go ahead and try to understand the simple concept. So this means for every q, as an element of the codomain, this whole thing has to be true, okay? So I always read it from the outside in, okay? But you don't have to, but out reading from the outside in seems to make more sense. So once I evaluate, when, when I get to the evaluation of whatever is in the parentheses, I already know that I'm looking at an element Q that is from the codomain. Is that okay? Okay, so now what do we want? From reading from the outside in, this is a comparison of one, has to be less than or equal to, and this is the cardinality, which means I'm counting the number of elements in the set that is surrounded by the vertical box. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. What is the set? Well, the set is described by the format of each element, so every element must have the, must be a two tuple for sure, okay? And then the second item of the two tuple has to be in Q, which we already know has to be an element of the code. The first element can be anything, okay? Well, not quite. Because P, Q together as a two tuple has to be an element of F, which is the function that we are trying to evaluate. Because what, what we are really trying to do is to say, is function F injective or not? F has to be a function to begin with, otherwise it makes no sense to determine whether it is injective or not. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay. So now the question is, um, how do we do this? Okay. So first of all, an example. Um, in this case, if f is, okay, so, okay. I'm not gonna read this part here. I will let you guys try to think of how to read what the mouse cursor is pointing to. What, the, what is that saying? If I say this whole thing is true, okay, what is it saying? It says that f is a function where the domain is the set of a, b, and then the codomain is the set of one, two, three. Okay, very good. But does it say how a is mapped to the codomain and how b is mapped to the codomain? Nope, it doesn't say anything about the mapping it simply states that it is a function, which is what we talked about in the previous class, and we also know that the domain is AB and the codomain is one, two, and three. Is that okay? All right, so given that is the case, is um, A2 as a two tuple, A1 as a two tuple, is, how do we evaluate this? The answer is right here. This is not even a function, so I'm not even going to bother with telling you whether it is an injection or not. So lo lo let's look at the second one. The second one has A and B both mapping, mapping to one, so uh, it is not an injection. 
So now the question is, how do we apply this definition to this Boolean quantified expression and say, okay, this whole thing is going to return false, but why? Okay. So what is the usual way that you would do it? Remember last time when we see for all blah, 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 we turn it into a loop. Okay, we turn it into a loop where for each iteration, it evaluates a single element of, in this case, you know, the codomain Y. Is that okay? How many elements do we have in the codomain? We got three, okay, so we have one, two, and three. So we'll start with one, okay? So if Q is one, which is definitely in the codomain, what is the set that is being specified here? In other words, I'm asking how many things or how many, what are the two tuples in F that map something from the domain to one? We got two of them, right? Both of them. Because A maps to one, B maps to one. So the set that we specify here would consist of both of these elements. So what is the cardinality of that set? Two. Okay, very good. Is two less than or equal to one? Nope. And because, so with a universal quantifier, which is for all, are we using a baked conjunction to connect all the things that we are evaluating, or are we using a disjunction to connect all the things? A conjunction, very good. So what if one item in the conjunction is false? The whole thing is false, which means, okay, we got our answer. This is not an injection. Is that okay? So even though there is a much more intuitive way to look at and evaluate whether a function is injective or not, I intentionally want to use something that looks like this, which is not incorrect, but it makes use of mathematical symbols in a very, very precise way. Because I want you guys to be used to it, okay? Because the more we use it, the more likely you're gonna get used to it, and it is a better way to think you know, when we know how to read you know, these notations. For the second one, is it injective? It is injective, right? Okay, so if in order to evaluate whether it is injective or not, we also we go through the loop, which has three iterations because there are three elements in the codomain here. So in the first iteration, we say, okay, what if Q equals to one? Well, if Q equals to one, then we have A1 that meets this requirement. So the set would have exactly one element is one less than or equal to one. We good, okay, move on to the next element in the codomain. Let's say Q equals to two. So now we're looking for something in F that ends with a two in the two tuple. Can we find it? Yep, B2, but that's only one element that meets this requirement. So that means this set is consisting with only one two tuple, which is B2, which also means the cardinality only has one. One is less than or equal to one. Yeah, we good. But yet, yeah, but wait, but wait, we're not done yet, okay? Because the codomain has three elements. What about when Q equals to three? When Q equals to three, then we say, okay, how? What are the elements in F where it is a two tuple ending with a three? Uh, there's nothing. It's okay. We just end up with an empty set, right? So an empty set. You can still take the cardinality of an empty set, it's an easy one, what is it? Zero. Is zero less than or equal to one? Yeah. And that, so that means we have true and true and true, which means the entire quantified expression is true. So that means you know, the last case, which is where the mouse pointer is pointing to, is in fact an injection. It is injective. The function is injective. Are we doing okay so far with you know, the, the process of how to evaluate a universally quantified expression? Yes or no? Okay. So you have to think about it using loops, okay? Because we are used to loops because of all the previous classes that you have taken. 
that makes it easier for you to go like, oh, okay, we just evaluate like a loop, and we're looping through every element in whatever set, you know, this, quant this quant quantifier is using to filter, you know, the, uh, everything in the universe. So with that said, we are now moving on to surjection. So a surjective function, okay, I'm going to go through the English description first, and then we'll go for the kind of obscure one. A surjective function, a, aka also known as a surjection, is a function where every element in the codomain is mapped to. So this statement is going to make sense to some people, but to some other people, it can sound ambiguous. Okay, so what we need to do is to look at you know um, a better way to describe this. The following statement is true for a surjection f of f is being a function x is the domain y is the codomain in addition to the requirement of being a function. This part here is really redundant because if we already know that f is a function, of course it has met all the requirements of being a function already, and whatever is specified next has to be quote unquote additional to the requirement of being a function. All right, so this is a double loop, okay? It's a double loop because, oh, sorry, for me did the wrong thing. This is a double loop because you know, for all q in y, is the outer loop, and there exists p in x is the inner loop. But the problem or the complexity of this is the existential quantifier is a big or, but the universal quantifier is a big and. So that means we have a big and on the outside, and then each thing that it is ending is a or. Are we doing okay so far with that concept? Hmm? Okay, the whole thing is a big and, okay, so the outermost thing to evaluate is an and, but each thing that is it is ending is an or. So we have blah, 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 or blah, 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 or blah, 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 and then another blah, 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 or blah, 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 or blah, blah, blah. You take all of these disjunctions, and then you make a big, big conjunction out of it. Okay, but it's a double loop, right? So the outer loop is iterating through elements in the codomain, the inner loop is iterating things from the domain. So by the time we get to the statement to be evaluated, then we have P being you know, um, an element of the domain, Q being an element in the codomain, and we're simply asking, you know, is, um, is that true? And but we only need one of them to be true, okay, for the innermost part of, of this. Okay, so it's time for an example. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at an example. And I'm going to use a mouse pad for this because I can type much faster in mouse pad compared to Joplin. All right, so let me move all of these out of the way, like that. And then we'll start from here. So we'll first look at an example where it is a surjection, okay? So we have um, x, which is the domain defined as uh, a, B, okay, and Y, which is our codomain defined as one, two, okay, for now. And then F is, okay, we'll make this a simple one, A1, B2, okay. First of all, we want to be, con we want to convince ourselves that F is in fact a function. Are we convinced? Okay, what, is, what does it take to be a function? You don't have to say it out loud because you know it, you just have to kind of make sure that mentally you know what it is. If every element in the domain maps to one and only one element in the codomain, then it is a function. Okay? So you look at every element in the domain. Okay, there's A. Does A map to one and only one thing in the codomain? Yep. Uh, there's B. Does B map to one and only one thing in the codomain? Yep. Okay, it is a function. So now, to set up the loop, okay? But I'm gonna do this only once or twice, okay? You guys have to kind of learn the process and then apply that to examples that maybe you would come up with. So we look at Q, okay? So Q can bind to A, Q can bind to B, because those are the only two elements in the codomain. And then for every iterate, so, so that takes care of the for all, okay? What I have on the whiteboard here, takes care of for all Q in Y. But what are we doing 
for each value q in y? Well, we have an inner loop, which is an existential quantifier. Well, at this point, I don't even care about whether it's existential or universal. I just know that we have another loop that is nested, okay? So in the nested loop, I'm looking at every possible way that I can give p a value, which is, you know, it has to be an element of the co-domain, a uh, domain, sorry. P has to be an element of the domain. I got it all flipped, didn't I? Yeah, I did. So Q should be bind to one and two because Q has to be an element of Y. So P is, has to bind to A and B because, so I do apologize, I got it all flipped. So P can be A, P can be B, and same thing over here. Are we good so far with the structure of the loop? So now we evaluate, okay? So we simply evaluate the expression, which is f of p equals to q. So in this case, what is f of um, a? Let's look at here, okay? What does, a, what does element a map to? One, okay? And in this case, q is also one. So what is this? Is this true or false? It is true, okay, so we just say, say true here. And then the next one is f of b equals to one. Because the one is coming from the q, the b is coming from the p. Is that true or not? It is false, okay. So we're gonna finish all the evaluation before we make conjunctions or disjunctions out of these things. So what about this one? This one is asking f of a is two. It is true or false? It is false. And then finally, we have this one, which is f of b uh, is 2. Is it true or false? It is true. Okay. So now the question is, um, what are we doing with this true and this false? Are they ORed or are they ANDed? They're ORed. That is correct. So now we take the true and false. So the inner loop is going to say true or false, which gives us true, and then it's the same with this inner loop here, because it's evaluating true or false, which gives us true. So now we have true, true for the outer loop, and how do we make use of the true, true of the outer loop? Are they ended together, or end, are they ORed together? They're ended together, so we have true and true, which is true, and that means the entire quantified expression is true. Which also means you know, this in this particular case, um, the function is surjective. All right, so I'm going to ask you guys, do you have any questions about how we went about doing this? Yes? Can you explain the difference? How about I write some pseudocode so you guys can figure it out, okay? So the out, so basically the loop is you know, you um, you basically say the result is okay. I'm, this is pseudocode, by the way. Okay, so it's it's not going to work in actual C. So we say the uh, okay, we might need to define the an outer overall scope. Okay, so do we'll, um, we'll say R one equals to an and so it is true to begin with and then we say for each q of y do the following so that is also a loop okay? and then inside this, this loop here we have for r2 which is by default false and then we have for each p of x to do the following which is yet another loop and then in here, okay, we're only saying R2 is going to be R2 or, okay, um, F of uh, P equals to Q. Oops, Q. And then we put these in parentheses. When we get out of the inner loop, then we have to say, okay, what are we going to do with the value of R2? How does that relate to R1? It says R1 becomes R2. One and R two, and then R two is the um, value of the entire quantified expression. 
Okay. So does that help? Oh, R1, you're correct. Sorry about that. There we go. Does that help? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so you, there's, there's no other way for me to express, you know, the meaning of for all and there exists. You know, this is kind of one, this is one of the best ways because it really translates that into as much of C code as possible the only thing that you cannot do in C code is there's no loop in C that can go through you know all the elements in an, uh, in a set because a set is not a built-in type of C or even C++. You can do a set with template classes, you know, which is okay, uh, but you know there's no direct control structure that can go through every element in a set in C. So this is the closest I can get. Is that okay? So at the end of today's lecture, I can give you guys you know, this file. So let me save it first, just in case something happens. 2024.0916.txt. Okay, so at the end of the class, I will kind of share that with you. All right. Is that okay? All right. So the next thing we do is to say, okay, what about the other way to express exactly the same thing? It's this one here. People are like, have we seen this before? Yes, we have seen something like this before with a very minor difference, okay? The difference between these two, okay, let me, I have to zoom out a little bit, so, uh, because I want to show both of these expressions. Look at this one, this quantified expression, and look at this one, this is also a quantified expression. What is the difference? What we call the relational operator is different, okay? Because the, the first one is less than or equal to, let me point to the relational operator, it is less than or equal to, the second one is greater than or equal to. That's the only difference, okay? But the way we evaluate this is the same way, okay? It is the same way to evaluate. Basically, this is asking, the second one is asking, um, if I count, the number of elements from the domain that maps to this particular thing in the codomain, is it at least one? If the answer is yes for every element in the codomain, then the function is surjective. In other words, we have something to map to everything in the codomain. Is that okay? So I'm not gonna go through the same steps you know, as what I did with the first one. You can probably just kind of go through this because you know, the only, oh, sorry, not that. But um, I verbally described the process, but you, know, you can probably go through the same process and show that you know, A1, B2 is surjective, A1, B1 is not surjective. Yes? Does that also imply that the domain has, the, the size of the domain is equal to or greater than the size of the subdomain? That is correct, very good. Okay, I like that observation because even without prompting, you know, you're making an observation go like, hey, if I combine this new thing that we are just defining with all the things that we have already understood, this has to be a natural result. In other words, for every surjection, the cardinality of the domain has to be greater than or equal to the cardinality of the codomain. Because otherwise, we are guaranteed to have at least one element in the codomain that is not mapped to. So we'll talk about what we call the pigeonhole principle later on, but that's basically what the pigeonhole principle is also trying to say. Yes? Can you repeat that uh, the, uh, for every surjection is uh, greater than or equal to? <laughs> sure. Okay, so if, okay, F is a surge, okay. I have to be careful with the implication, so I'm gonna use parentheses here. F is a surjection implies uh, the, uh, okay, I'm going to use the notation here because I don't want to type cardinality up you know, all over the place. The cardinality of the domain has to be greater than or equal to the cardinality of the uh, codomain. 
that's basically what I just said. Is that okay? Does that make sense to you? In order for everything in the code domain to be mapped, you better have as many things in the domain to begin with. Okay, I say that. <clears throat> All right, so I'll be okay so far. Okay. okay, I can see you guys probably need a short break. We'll take a look. Today is 2024, 09.16. You cannot see it yet. You know, I'm going to show it now. And I think I got the time right. You guys can, if you have enough time to do it. Yeah, 10 minutes. And the access code is Hungarian, all lowercase. Now, obviously, I'm not Hungarian. The reason why I used at the access code as Hungarian was because I was talking about sorting algorithm that particular semester. And you can go to YouTube and find Hungarian dance that explains sorting algorithms. And I'm not kidding you. If you want to understand how bubble sort works, but you feel that, yeah, So I think they have a bubble sort. They have selection sort. I'm not sure about the other sorting algorithm. Do they have merge sort also? Yeah, merge sort is my personal favorite. Quick sort is messy. I don't like merge sort. I mean quick sort. So does anyone need more time for the road taking activity before we go back to the heavy duty stuff that we have been talking about? Okay. Let me go back to, oh, okay. Wrong thing to go back to here. All right, so now we talk about bijection. Now, once we understand injection and surjection, bijection is super easy. It simply means it's both. So let me go back to the normal zoom ratio. So a bijective function, also known as a bijection, is a function that is both injective and surjective. Now, if you recognize this as the requirement for the quantified expression that is true if and only if f is an injection, this is the quantified expression that is true if and only if function f is a surjection. So that means in order for a function f to be a bijection, ah, we just change the less than or equal to and greater than or equal to to equal to because that is the conjunction. If something is less than or equal to less than or equal to one and at the same time greater than or equal to one, it equals one. So you look at this and go like, but isn't that the qualification of being a function to begin with? The answer is no because we are iterating the wrong thing, a different thing, I should say, okay? In order for this to be qualifying a set of two tuples to be a function, this is for all P in X, okay? But when it is for all Q in Y, it is meaning it is a bijection. Okay, so there's a little bit, they are a little bit different. Can you say the last thing one more time? Okay. Instead of saying that, how about I show you where to find that? Because I think it is much more important that you know where I got that to begin with. Okay, so let me go back to all the modules and then go to functions. Okay, function that sets. Okay, this is the module that you get that original quantified expression, so it goes to do, 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 right here. So this is one, and this is the other one. You can see how they are very similar. Look at this one, and everything is, it, but this is X, which is the domain. This one is Y, which is the codomain. So the first one, which is this one, tells us whether f is a function or not. 
This one, on the other hand, given that f is a function, this one tells me whether f is a bijection or not. Yep. This is a bijection function, right? A bijection, okay, so right here, a bijection is simply a shorter name for a bijective function. Mm -hmm. All right. So what are you going to do with all of these quantified expressions, definitions, and whatnot? We'll just leave it in text module because I don't want to see it. Okay? Or do you want to kind of understand every single one of these and put it onto your own sheet of paper, and then you have all the definitions all together? Because once you see you know, the quantified expression for injection, for surjection, and then for bijection, and also the quantified expression to tell you whether a function is a function or not, you look at all of those, and then you start to see, oh, okay, they're similar in, in structure, but they mean slightly different things. And, and that is important, okay? Are we still doing okay so far with these concepts? Okay, so now we talk about you know, the concept of an inverse function, or simply called the inverse. A bijection is always quote unquote reversible, which is not a mathematical is not a mathematical term. Inverse is, in other words, given a bijection, f is a function, x is the domain, y is a codomain. There's always another bijection that we call f inverse, that maps from y to x, and it is also a bijection. I would just said it's a bijection. Okay, so what does that mean? Okay, you know, give me an example to show this. So the example to show this okay, is rather easy. Okay, so we'll use the same one that we have used before. First of all, I define f as a function where it is mapping from a, b to 1, 2. Okay, so that really doesn't tell us how things are mapped. It simply says a, b is the domain and 1, 2 is the codomain. But then I can say, okay, let's go ahead and actually define function f. So f is mapping, say, a to 2, and then b to 1. Okay, yes, I changed things up a little bit here. Okay, so let's look at this definition of f, and we ask, okay, first of all, is it a function? In other words, if I look at every element in the domain, is that element mapped to one and only one thing in the codomain? Okay, so let's do that. Uh, a is in domain, a is in the domain, and it is mapped to one and only one thing in the codomain, which is two. Okay, cool. Um, are, do we have any other elements in the domain? Yeah, we got B. Okay, look at B. B is mapped to one, which is also in the codomain. And is it mapping to one and only one thing in the codomain? Yes. So that means F is a function. Is it a bijection? Okay, which means, first of all, is it an injection first? Well, what do you think? In order to evaluate whether something is an injection, we look at every element in the codomain and ask, um, is for each element in the codomain, is it true that there's only up to one element in the domain mapping to it? So we look at one first, and we ask, how many things are mapping to one? Uh, just one. But is one up to one? Meet the requirement of up to one? Yep, okay. So let's look at the other element in the codomain too, and if we ask the same question, uh, if we look at the entire function, do we only have up to one element in the domain mapping to two? Uh, yeah, only A is mapping to two. So it satisfies both of those requirements, and that makes this particular function an injection, okay? So now we also ask the question of, is it a surjection? Well, we are, really, we are really asking a very similar question, but instead of asking, is it up to one, we're asking at least one, okay? But it's the same question, okay? We go through every element in the, in the codomain, and then we ask, okay, let's look at the codomain element two. Okay, this time we start with two, because there's no intrinsic ordering within the set. So we start with two, and we ask, okay, is it true that there's only, there's up, okay, let me go back. We look at two as an element in the codomain, and then we ask, is it true that there are at least one thing in the domain mapping to two? Look at the actual function definition and go like, yeah, there's one thing mapping to two, but that meets the requirement of at least one, which is greater than a 
to the one, right? And then we go like, but wait, there's another element in the good domain one. And then we ask the same question. Is it true that there are at least one thing in the domain mapping to the element one in the codomain? Um, let's see, uh, P is the only one mapping to one. There's only one, but does that meet the requirement of at least one? Yes, it does. So now we, we have just evaluated the whole thing and say that it is also surjective. So because it's injective and surjective, it is now bijective. Are we good so far? So without saying or writing down anything, I just verbally go through the same logic, the same process that we have talked about to show that this F is, all, is definitely a bijective. Yes? So can you store it by jumping and not in the domain? I don't think we have enough time to do it, but you can certainly kind of transcribe what I said or have YouTube do it. YouTube actually does it fairly well. But it's the same process as what we did earlier in class. You know, so it is important that you guys can replicate the process. Okay. So now we can say, okay, um, we claim that there's an inverse function. I cannot really do the uh, sub superscript of negative one. So I'm going to say, okay, let's evaluate this fun function d here. Uh, g maps two to a, and it maps one to b. Okay. So first of all. If I say, you know, is G a function that maps from one, two as the domain to A, B as the codomain? Yes, okay, for the same reason that we showed earlier that F is a function. So the next question is, if I define G exactly like this, using one, two as my domain and A, B as my codomain, is G a bijection? The answer is yes, it is, okay? So in this case, G is known as the inverse of F. Why is it called the inverse of F? For one reason. In mathematics, if F and G are inverses of each other, then F applied to the G of something is always the something that you start off with, and then the other way around is true as well. If you nest it this way, you also just get X back. Okay, so we look at the last two lines here. Do we have any questions about that? Because this is the requirement for F and G to be inverses of each other. Are we doing okay so far? Okay, let me give you an example. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, you don't have a question, okay. So let me give you an example, okay? So let's say f of x, okay, this time I give you an actual concrete example, is two plus x, okay? What do you think the inverse is in this case? x minus two, all right, okay? Well, okay, we wanna make sure it works, okay? So we're gonna nest those things in a specific way. So we'll start this first, okay? So that becomes, you know, two plus the g of x, it becomes two plus uh, g of x is x minus two, oops, like that. And if you practice your algebra, you get x back. And then what about the other way around? g of f of x is, um, let's see, g of x is defined as uh, x minus two, so this becomes f of x minus two, which then we expand f of x is two plus x, so it becomes two plus x, the whole thing minus two, Yes, I had a typo here. This is supposed to be a two. And using your algebra, it also, this also evaluates back to x. So that's just you know, a very interesting example to illustrate you know, when you apply the a function and an inverse function, you know, it doesn't matter which way you stack it, you always get back what you started off with. Okay. Are we doing okay so far? So not every math function is a bijection, okay? So for example, so can someone give me an example of a math function that is not a bijection? Well, there are plenty, but give me one. Hmm? 
adding another you mean for the example here yeah. yeah if you add one more element to only one side but not the other side then it would definitely not be surjective because you have too many things on one side yep. if you add one more to the uh, code domain then it, it cannot be surjective and therefore it cannot be bijective if you add one more to the domain then it cannot be injective because if you have three things in the domain and only two things in the codomain, there is no way for the three things in the codomain to all map to unique things in the codomain. Does it make sense? I have a lot of, you know, I wouldn't say inappropriate, but sensitive examples that I could not use. <clears throat> Are we still doing okay so far with these concepts? Okay, I, I do have to mention one thing, okay? This is really important. The lecture, you know, what I'm talking about right now, as well as the notes, okay, the reading materials, they were never meant to be a one-pass thing, okay? Um, some people can do it, but I would not make the <coughs> assumption that you can read or listen to the lecture with one pass and get everything that you're supposed to. Which means you probably have to go through several passes at the material to get all the material that you need to understand. All right, so I just want to make it clear because you know, I think there may be some assumptions because of other classes that we have, people have taken where you know, they can just go for, for one pass and they get everything down, okay? But for this class, okay, okay for every class that I teach, okay? Yes, I just use the universal quantifier. Nobody is laughing, but I did, okay? I just used the quantifier. For every class that I teach, you know, one pass is usually not enough. And that's why for every hour of lecture, because I don't want to lecture you. I want you to develop, to internalize that and lecture yourself. Okay, you guys are not laughing. This is supposed to be funny, okay? I guess you know, as a student, you may not find it funny. Okay, for every hour of lecture, you're supposed to spend two hours outside of the lecture to read the material, to take your notes, to refine your notes, to go through my written material, turn it into your notes, and so on, okay? Um, does it mean that everybody need two hours, you know, the two to one ratio? No, some people can probably get away with one to one or even less, okay? But two to one is the average for an average class. And this is not an average class, okay? This is the capstone class, which means this is the very last class that many of you will take before you transfer to a four-year university. Is that okay? So try to internalize that lecture so that I don't have to tell you again, so that you can tell yourself, it's like, did I spend two hours for each hour of lecture, at least for tax class? I don't care what you do with your history classes. <laughs> but for this class, okay, it is almost essential to do that. All right, so we, we are talking about the uh, inverses, okay? So, so the bottom line of an inverse is exactly, you know, what I just talked about. So we'll, we'll skip all the technical stuff here, and we'll skip all the way to the sorting example, okay? So basically, we, what we're trying to figure out is Okay, given that we have the vocabulary that we have now, okay, can we describe the outcome of a sorting algorithm in the proper way? The answer is yes, okay? It is not written here because I don't want to just give you the answer. So let's go ahead and take a look at, you know, how we would describe the proper outcome of a sorting algorithm, okay? So for that, I actually need Doppler because I need to use mathematical notations for that one. There we go, Joplin. Okay, so we'll just go ahead and say the following describes, describes the proper outcome of a sorting algorithm. Do I really care what sorting algorithm you use? I don't really care, okay? For all I know, it can be bubble sort, it can be selection sort, it can be sort by pixels, okay? Magical creatures, okay? All I want to describe is what should the, what, 
how should the input relate to the output, okay? So we'll go ahead, I'll give you some assumptions, okay? So let array A be the input to the sorting, okay, I'll call this a sort in place, sorting algorithm, which means when everything is done, then everything should be in array A again, okay? <clears throat> Um, we'll also use a shorthand, okay, so let um, n be the length of array A, okay, so this way I don't have to use bar A bar all, the, all over the places, which makes it kind of harder to read, okay. How do we describe the uh, condition when the algorithm properly sorts um, elements in array A. We can assume array A has at least two elements, which I don't think is really needed, but we'll go ahead and make that assumption. Okay, all right. So I think most of you remember the one thing that we talked about, okay? So we basically remember that uh, um, For all, okay, for all, I, and I'm going to use this notation, okay, let me see if you guys are familiar with this notation, uh, zero dot dot n, blah blah, okay, so does there, is everybody familiar with, oh, okay, I need to use a close paren and not a one here, or we can just make it n minus one, same thing, so is everybody comfortable with this notation, which means there are all the integers, starting and including zero, ending with, and also including n minus one. It specifies an inclusive range between zero and n minus one. Is that notation okay? All right. So if I were to use round parentheses, it means excluding the n. Square bracket means including the n, okay? All right, so what do we want to specify here, okay? You know, this is something that we talked about last time. In fact, you know, I actually made a mistake here. It should be n minus two. So we want a bracket i, you know, array i of array a, element i of array a, to be less than or equal to a bracket i minus one, which is array i minus one, excuse me, element i minus one of a, a plus i plus one. Okay, so minus one here, there we go. Okay, so this is the one thing that you guys mentioned, right? Okay, somebody mentioned that, you know, okay, once the algorithm is done sorting, you know, we need this condition to be true. The answer is yes, okay? This is a necessary condition to, to describe the outcome of a sorting algorithm, but it's not the only one, because I just wrote an algorithm to initialize all the elements of A to zero, and it meets this requirement, because the question is, is zero less than or equal to zero? Yes, but that algorithm is definitely not sorting. Okay, just initialize everything in the array to zero, is not sorting the array. So now the question is, how do we describe the actual one, okay? So now we need to add some additional you know, stuff here. So now we have to use this, another assumption. Assume um, a, a k bracket i, or k, k subscript i is a bracket i before the algorithm runs, okay? So this is really more than more than anything else, this is just a notation to remember, you know, what the values were for each element in the array. It is k of i, is that okay? So k zero is remembering what was a bracket zero. K one is remembering what was a bracket one before I run the sorting algorithm. Is that okay? All right. So k, okay, this means k, oops, k bracket zero is the value of a bracket zero before running whatever the algorithm is. And same thing for, you know, uh, k of one versus a bracket one, k of two versus a bracket two and so on. I just need a way to denote, okay, what the values used to be 
before I run the algorithm. Okay, so it's a notational thing. It doesn't really have any meaning by themselves. Okay, so now I can now specify some additional stuff. Okay, there exists. Okay, or if you prefer, <laughs> I'll use the the symbols here. There exists some kind of a function. Let me see. F is fine. Okay. Okay. So we'll say there exists a function f. Okay. Let me use the notation. Okay. So the function maps from a certain range to a certain range, and I take it back. You know, I'm going to use the same notation as we what we had before. It goes from zero to n minus one, and then it also maps to the same range, which is from zero to n minus one. Okay, so what this means is we are looking at a function f, that is, we are looking at a function, which is f, it uses the integers from 0 to n minus 1 inclusively as the domain, and it maps those integers to another set of integers which is identical to the domain, which is also from 0 to n minus 1 inclusively. Are we good? Okay. I'll give you an example. I think we might have enough time for an example here, such that um, when the algorithm is completed, um, a bracket, okay, I'll use quantifiers again for every i in 0 dot dot n minus 1, um, a bracket i equals to k subscript f of i. Um, I'm just looking at the nesting here because I can, I can easily lose track of that. Yep, okay. All right, so let me go back and say and the following, okay? So this is still required, okay? But on top of that, we also need something like this, okay? Assuming k of i is denoting the original value of element i of array a, we need to find this function. Okay, so you guys go like, I have no idea what this means, okay? That's okay, we'll give you an example. So in this case, let's say, okay, so uh, let's say example, example. So let's say array a, I'm just gonna list the elements, you know, one by one. So we'll say a uh, array a used to be um, let's make it not sorted, okay? So we'll have six, two, uh, five, and one, okay? That's not sorted. So it's a four tuple, which is an array, okay? If you look at this, it is not sorted. Mm -hmm. To make it a little bit more fun, we'll go, we'll have another one here, okay? So we'll, we'll stash another one here. All right, and we want to sort the array so that it is not decreased in a non-decreasing order, which means it can be the same, but definitely not decreasing, okay? So now the question is, um, we know what it looks like when it's sorted, don't we? I hope so, right? So after the algorithm, so A should be one, one, two, five, six. So the question now is, uh, that doesn't really answer the question of that function f, right? So function f in this case, okay? is a set of two tuples. So now we have to ask, what are we mapping to what? In other words, um, this is a bracket, this is k bracket, k subscript zero. Where did it go? Well, it can go back to itself. So zero can map to zero. But then we look at the other one and we go like, this was k four, right? Because this is k zero, k one, k two, k three, k four. This is k four. But K4 has to map to which position? In other words, this is four, and you know, what element needs to, um, it has to map to what? Or the, the reverse question is, this is the new position, which is one. One has to map to four. So basically, we have now one mapping to four. What about position two? Position two after sorting is the two over here. 
and is mapping to k of 2 because k of 2 denotes the original value at uh, index 2. So 2 maps to 2 is fine. What about 3? This is k3. k3 is the 5. 5 also stays here in place, so 3 maps to 3. What about 4? Um, okay, I think I made a mistake somewhere. No, nope, I did not. This is 4. So um, position 4 after the array is sorted maps to k of 2. So that means your 4 has to map to 2. Hmm? Oh, maps to 1, you're correct. Maps to 1. All right. So now we look at this. Okay, this is the function. First of all, is it a bijection? Because you know, the domain and the codomain are both 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Because we only go up to n minus 1. Is it a function? 0 is mapped to 1 and only one thing. 1 is mapped to 1 and only one thing. Same to this 2, 3, and 4. Okay, very good. Is it an injection? Which means um, we only map domain elements to unique elements in the codomain. Okay, 0, 4, 2, 3, 1, they're all different. <coughs> so it's injection, so it's injective. Is it bijective? So we look at the codomain and ask, is everything used? 0 is used here, 1 is used here, 2 is used here, 3 is used here, 4 is used here. So it is surjective. It is a bijection, okay? Then we ask the final question, which is, you know, if I apply... You know, if I try to evaluate this particular quantified expression, is it true? Okay, when i equals to one, okay, does a bracket i, um, a, when i equals to zero, okay, when i equals to zero, a bracket zero equals to a bracket f of zero. So f of zero is zero. So that means your know, one is not moved. What happens when i equals to one? When i equals to one, this is after sorting. A bracket of one is the same as a bracket is the same as f subscript f of one. F of one is four, so we are looking at this one over here. Ah, so we can map this one to this one over here. The bottom line is we make sure that every value to, that we began with ended up somewhere in the array after we have sorted. And that is a requirement on top of the original one, which is you know, an element has to be less than or equal to, to its neighbor. So this is one application of why bijection is actually useful, because this actually gives us the vocabulary to specify the proper outcome of a sorting algorithm. You would never imagine that, right? You know, to describe an array as quote unquote sorted would be this involved. So on Wednesday, we're gonna move on. Okay, so I'll, I, will, I will send this to you, you know, in just a little bit. On Wednesday, we're gonna move on and talk about um, Aleph No, okay? Aleph No is not gonna be a very easy chapter. So I'm giving you guys some warning already. So this is the module that we are going to use, that we are going to talk about on Wednesday. It is not an easy one, which means you might want to spend some time to read a little bit ahead before class. And then when you're in class, you'll make sure that all your questions as you read this module are answered. Okay, yep. Uh, when I try to open something that module, it says four. It says what? I got a 404. You got a 404? Okay, I could have blocked the... Uh, URL. You're correct. Okay. Um, okay. I'll fix it by the way. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. It has to do with, um, I have to, because my HTML document is not indexed, so I have to spell it out. So let me try that one more time just to make sure. It loads the time. Thank you. I would not have caught it. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to turn off the mic to answer additional questions.